Welcome. Welcome to my internet archive library. I've been busy uploading tens of thousands of PDFs um, that I've gathered over the years, covering all different sorts of um, topics and subjects. I haven't finished yet, but uh, I've got a, a fair bulk of what I had done a couple of years ago. Knowledge is power and the more we can freely share it with each other, the better off we are and the more people that have access to information to find out for themselves. And when I talk about freedom, I'm not just talking about censorship, I'm talking about the fact that so much information already comes with its own censorship. It's called cost. How much does it cost to buy it? See, I have this real thing about... Um, I'm not a rich person. Um, in fact, I've pretty well got rid of most of my material possessions after I had to let go of most of them because most of them got stolen in several different instances by people that, um, yeah, you trust the wrong people, shit happens. But So knowledge is power and I don't believe that knowledge belongs to anyone to put a cost on it. And uh, a couple of years, well, about three years ago, um, I asked somebody who was a channeler whether I could upload some of her old um, MP3 materials, which I found beneficial to me to con to confirm. Actually, I had a lot of aha moments when I was listening to things. There was a lot of questions that I had and everything too, but. Um, Certainly, a lot of it resonated with me, and I knew it would with others, and I wanted to share it. So, I asked her, and um, I didn't hear back from her. And I thought, well, no one ever gets back to you when you ask for permission. So, you know what? I'm just going to upload them. Well, then, as soon as I uploaded them, she got back to me and said, "Well, I'd prefer it if you didn't, because that's my income." And that's the thing that I've got you know she said whilst you know um, I appreciate that you want to share it and blah 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 you know it is how I survive and everything and that has been one of the conflicts for me over the years too is that um, you know like my son right now if I told him what I share with a lot of other people here and say that I will never ever ask you for money I'm actually leading him to believe that I've actually got it monetized because he'd think I'm stupid for not doing it but I cannot put a price on knowledge it is just it's not within me to do that it is not mine to sell in any way shape or form and I don't believe it belongs to anyone and even all these channelers that say oh well you don't need me just go directly it's like yeah well if I don't need you to trigger that um, knowledge in me or that journey to start in a different direction what is your purpose anyway I mean, most of them are just purely repeating the same things over and over and over. I mean, I have listened to probably thousands of hours worth of channelers now, and I just would like them to come up with something different. I would like someone to ask them questions that are relevant and haven't been asked before. But nobody does that. They're all stuck in this little bubble. So I get quite frustrated when people put a cost on things. But one thing that channelers do say is that you don't need anybody else uh, is true. I'll tell you a little story about what, um, that a little bit later on. But first of all, I'll introduce you to a library that you can touch, feel, see, read, hear and look at. 
and I've done an index. I'll open this up in a new tab here. Just so you can see that um, there's tens of thousands. I couldn't possibly show them all to you. But I'll just open up the PDF. Because that will open in the browser. Eighty pages worth of uh, indexes. So if you are looking for a particular author um, or subject, I, I recommend going straight to the index, um, doing a find and looking for all the different options. Now, um, I do apologise, there is a couple of repeats in a couple of sections because I had previously uploaded these and I was limited by, um, I uploaded them to Dropbox. And because there was, well, there's over 80 gigabytes so far in the library and you can only put two gig in a free library. So I tried a tricky thing, which worked for a little bit, but then um, they must have figured out it all came back to the same IP address and only the last email address and files that I uploaded were still there. So it wiped them all out. And I was really annoyed at that because it took me two weeks to upload them by changing from one email, activating that and uploading there and it w and making sure that the files were under two gig because that was the limit in the Dropbox. And I thought, well, this was a really good way to permanently upload information and make it freely available to people. It didn't work though, and I don't know when it stopped working because um, I only checked it a couple of months ago and I found that all the links weren't working and I thought, well, that explains a few things. So I've covered a lot of different subjects in these books. Uh, I've had them in a lot of them, of course, I could not have read all of these books. Uh, I would come across a place that would have a, a few of the, the books that I wanted and they would be within a bigger um, collection of books and I'd just grab that whole collection. And uh, ultimately, it's been a resource library because, um, you know, when you do a, a search through um, certain programs it looks inside all the PDFs and looks for keyword look uh, and you can find things that way so essentially I created my own library I have read a large portion of them though but then before that I did <laughs> I've poured my way through about five big bookcases full of real books so that's how you get on to the index and uh, there are all the files there, the various files. Most of them are PDFs, but there are some videos and MP3s in there. Now, when it comes to videos, one thing I did find is that um, because of something I'm going to be doing shortly, I wanted to be able to make reference to the movie The Men Who Stare at Goats. And I used to have a copy of it, but... Um, uh, unfortunately that uh, hard drive got wiped and I tried looking for another copy and I didn't realize how difficult it was it's banned in so many countries you can't even watch it and I thought okay so I finally got a, came across the place and got a copy of it and uploaded it to BitChute but it's a pretty crappy version because it only had 24 frames per minute but I just figured out how to get 30 frames per minute out of my screen record, so I might redo that again. But um, yeah, I also found out from doing that that um, I, I searched the internet for a copy of The Men Who Stare at Goats, and it actually brought me up a link to the um, internet archives here that somebody else had done. And when I clicked on it, it said that the um, copyright owner had... Um, you know pulled the video so there is a limitation to what you can actually put on archive.org even though they don't censor it or anything I suppose if someone comes across you know something 
they don't want they will search all these places because this is um, archive org is your way back machine and it's it's a good place to use anyone can sign up I just signed up got it confirmed instantly I had a little bit of an issue they thought because of the number of accounts in the beginning that I would spam it gave me an email to um, to send that uh, error to and the day after I you know I haven't looked back and I've just been uploading ever since and I've been able to back up and get all of these files onto the internet so that people can actually look at them for themselves anyway because I am a great believer that you know you can lead a, a horse to water but you can't make them drink it so all I feel the the need to do is show where the water is you know you can drink it or not now I just wanted to explain a little bit about the Edgar case readings um, I had for years before the internet and everything gone and found any and every single book I possibly could that had any mention of the Edgar Case readings in it but none of them were actually the readings all it was were people saying oh you know this reading number says this and you know that's secondhand information I want to know that that's what it said and so for years and years it bothered me you know I had gone through all these books and p pulled out all the readings of Edgar Case and gotten as much pure information that they said was just his that they quoted was his you know but then there was never the full story it was always what they had taken to use to prove their narrative I just wanted to look at the Edgar case readings so then back in well, I think it was 2004-5 I had um, the, a computer the internet and the curiosity to see if there was anything online about Ed, Edgar case and that's when I found the um, ARE, I can't even remember what it stands for now, but it's basically the association that uh, holds all his readings. And I went online uh, and I found the, the site because I'd done a search on it and it came up with a direct link to an Edgar Case reading. And I thought, oh wow, this is, this is brilliant they've actually got the readings the actual tangible readings not some of them and you would open them up you would read down it and it is clearly defined in very set format every single reading and I went to um, click on a tab and go to the library to get the rest of the text so because there was something like 15,000 odd and it said unauthorized error and I thought oh no but you see that was back in the days when computer um, computer <laughs> websites were actually a lot less encrypted so what I actually did was and I still do it today to see if it still works and some sites it does is that you go up to the tab and you just delete that so it will bring up the page before and the page before said it was the index page now even though I couldn't access the readings directly if I took that off it brought me back to the index page and suddenly I had um, what ended up being just over 14,000 readings a lot of the readings that um, were done um, some weren't recorded because of anonymity I mean they were but they were given directly to those people and even though they were logged as a reading it was logged as a no reading 
So there are a lot of no readings because uh, Edgar Case did do readings for a lot of very influential people. So when you go into the Edgar Case, um, where to put him? All right, so when you go into the Edgar Case readings, I would recommend just downloading the whole lot because if you go into try and download individually, it will come up with, it's only 56 megabytes, but there are thousands and thousands of files in there. They are only text files. See, these ones here are actually that, websites category listings so it, it tells you all the different subjects that are covered there are a lot of health readings on there but all the the readings of Edgar Case are here they all start off and they go through all the way through now years ago I did go through and add to the end some form of trying to be able to classify readings because some of them are, are pretty boring they're just um, uh, medical ones that um, in one sense I say they're boring in another they're not because uh, they're very valuable natural healing methods but uh, Edgar Case deals with um, auras, colours uh, he covers a lot of history in certain ones and there are certain ones where he actually does state things. He talks about uh, several past civilizations, cultures, and uh, yeah, he just covers a lot of, yes, dreams, uh, past life regressions, past life readings. See this one here, a life reading? That would be someone that has done a past um, that he's done a past life reading on. Now when it says it's 2613, 26 is a 29 year old female housewife and she's a Protestant. And 13 is the 13th reading that she's come in for. And this is what an Edgar Case reading looks like. It goes through, um, you've got the person that's asking Edgar Case these questions and he answers them. And then at the bottom you've got a little, um, you've got follow-ups. And that's what I find incredibly interesting too because they were monitoring, uh, they were following up on what he had actually produced as far as information. That's why there's a whole body of, of information out there that people keep focused on to support certain things. And most of it is to do with uh, past civilizations. They do not tend to focus very much on the healing aspects of all his readings, which is the majority of it. Because this is the 13th reading. All those 12 before could have all been on health issues and uh, some of them he does specifically on auras so I mean it is a huge body of work but as I said because of the referencing down here and how they've they've uh, tied everything together you can actually get some overall view of the validity of the information and whether it carries on into another reading or is relevant. See here it makes um, references to previous physical readings and life readings 263-4 on well, I'm not sure how that's dated because American and uh, I would say that's the 3rd of June 1935 but uh, can't be because down here it's the 12th of the 16th so it would actually be the 6th of March 35 yeah you've got to do that when you live in the southern hemisphere everything is reversed 
even the way the sun and the moon come up. Yes, it comes up on different sides in different hemispheres because to actually look at the horizon to watch these things come up, you're facing different directions. So in, ta in Tasmania, in the southern hemisphere, the sun comes up. If I'm looking, it comes up on my right shoulder and sets on my left. Whereas if you're in the northern hemisphere, it rises on your left shoulder and sets on your right. So it's a completely opposite perspective. And you can clearly notice this if I showed you videos of uh, the star movement and sun and moon movement uh, that I videoed myself, you would actually say, if you lived in the northern hemisphere, that's all backwards because from my perspective that's how I see it and we need to understand that too that not only do we have two hemispheres of our brain but we also have two hemispheres of the planet that have two different perspectives so you know think about that so I think I've showed you pretty much how to access that um, I will leave a link for um, this PDF and this uh, oops, we'll go back to it. This main site, so that you, you can pick and choose however way you wanted to access the information. So, as I said, that's your solid and tangible and real way of obtaining knowledge for yourself. There are, however, other ways and they include dreams that you have when you are asleep they are um, lucid dreams what, what would come to you as daydreams deja vu or um, a sense of knowing um, there is an, an experience I'm going to share with you now that happened back to me, with me, to me, <laughs> in 1988 that was a way of gaining information that I couldn't find it anywhere in any book. I can't find it in uh, any digital internet place. I know that there is no record of this because where I got the information from I know it's true I know it's real because I saw it all and when people call it downloads these days but before they used to call it downloads and I got all this information and blah 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 I used to just call it um, a sense of knowing there are some places that you can go to that um, you cannot but help feel something about the place. There is just something. You don't know what it is. You can't see it. You can't touch it. You can't even smell it. But there, all your physical senses are on alert to it for some reason. There is something. Well, in this instance, something really wrong with this place. At the beginning of 1988, uh, I was still working at Dun & Bradstreet in, in Victoria and I had a new boss. Now he was a great boss but he just wasn't the old boss and without my old boss there things weren't the same and besides I'd never meant to stay in Melbourne. I'd already been there long enough. I was always heading to Western Australia. That's another story. I'll stick to this one. So I um, quit my job at Dun & Bradstreet. And uh, after I had worked at the uh, Port Arthur pub as a barmaid, I had barmaid experience. And that's how come I travelled and worked all over Australia I'd first moved somewhere get a barmaid job well that was after here anyway 
um, I'd get a barmaid job and then get a, a full-time job. When I first moved to Melbourne, my grandparents were there, so I stayed with them until I got a job. And So it wasn't until after I left. When I did leave for Western Australia, I didn't have really a cent to my name. I had nowhere to go, no job to go to. But uh, hey, that's the gypsy in me and the adventurer that, you know what, something will happen. And besides that, I can always get a job as a barmaid. So I worked at, as a barmaid at uh, the pub just down the road here, along this road here in Brighton. And there was another woman in there that uh, she was also from Tasmania. And we met and um, we got along. She only did the bar work part time. She worked full time for extra clothing which was a subsidiary type of just jeans at the time. So um, we got along like a house on fire, you know, we, we became really good friends and I moved in to Spray Street with her, just down the road there. And that's at the time I was still working at the Brighton pub, I had been getting quite a bit of work there and you know, whilst it was um, enjoyable and paid the bills and everything, it, it wasn't really something that I wanted to, to do. So when um, the woman that I knew, she worked up here, there was um, Just Jeans had an extra shop that they were closing down and they were going to set up a Just Jeans shop in there and they wanted her to go in and clean up the mess and get it ready. She was kind of known within the company for doing that. So I'm not going to explain the bizarre world of just you, just me, just jeans. I'll try and keep it on track to this experience and how I ended up working in this shop and experiencing what I did. So she was working in this shop and she said, um, come down and pick out some stuff because there was all these boxes in there of all these extra clothing lines that they were just going to throw out and she said come down and have a look so I went down and had a look in some of the boxes and it was like Christmas for nothing you know all these, these clothes and they were good quality clothes but uh, the thing was that when I walked into the shop you could feel it straight away you know it's it's not a very comfortable place to be I didn't want to be there but you didn't give it too much thought she took me out the back uh, to where the boxes were and it was like yeah I'm not really liking this very much but again you know boxes full of free clothes so the um sorry I got interrupted so I'm I know where I'd got to and I'd I'd been in and out of the shop over the next couple of months while this woman that I was uh, flatting with was getting rid of the old extra stock and setting up the, the Just Jeans store so that it could open to the public. A couple of times I took lunch down to her and the first time I took lunch down to her um, I'll just describe the shop. You just walk in, it's nothing flash, it's just, you know, a little square room. At the other end of where you walk in, you can see there's another door. Uh, that's the door to out the back. You open that up, you go up a step. Um, you look over, there was a, a lay-by rack that was hanging on the left there, just past there. There's a staircase up to the left, there's a door out to the right and you just walk straight into the kitchen which is where she had pulled the boxes to to um, go through to have a look at the clothes and this day she when I'd brought her down lunch she said oh let's go upstairs and have lunch because uh, upstairs used to be rented out and what I found out later is that um, it's been rented out so many times but nobody will stay in there and what people talk about they experience in there well 
I can understand why nobody stays there. And even more curious, when I could even look these things up online and look at Google, I'll take you down, it seems that nobody's going to be living there anymore because they've boarded up the windows. And there's a good reason for that. Yes, it stands out, doesn't it? It's this one with the boarded up windows. When I first looked at it a few years ago, it looked a little bit different. There was only um, blackout on the windows, like boards that have been blacked out. Now it looks like the whole veneer has been bricked over. But as you can see, it's a simple little shop. You walk in there, there's a door up the back. It's only a few steps to go up the stairs, the wind around and come up to the top. There's a room that goes back and there's a bathroom that's here and then you come out into the lounge room. And the day that I went in there, I sat in this corner. It was a sunny day. Um, there was not a stitch of furniture in there. It was completely empty. And I sat right in this corner because I wouldn't sit anywhere else. I didn't even want to be in there, but I'll tell you how it got up there anyway. And so, yes, yeah, so opposite that stairway to go up uh, is the door to go out the back, which goes out past to the car park out the back. But it goes past these two little, I don't know, they must have been old coal um, where, you know, you'd get your coal delivered for heating or whatever back in the day. They were like cellar type things. And, yeah, that's part of the story coming up because that creeped me out too. And you just kept going forward, you'd go into the kitchen area. So this day I'd gone in and uh, taken her a lunch and she said, oh, let's go upstairs, it's a nice sunny day, we can sit in the sun. And I didn't really want to go up there because, you know, whilst I'm not on high alert at the moment, it, it doesn't make me feel comfortable to be in this place. And I thought, oh, well, you know, yeah, let's go. So we opened up the back, the door at the back of the shop and took a couple of steps towards the steps to go up. Now before I even set foot on the bottom of the stairs to go up, I started to get all the hairs on my body started to stand on end. I would get this flushing sensation going through my body and it was it was really noticeable because it was it just hit me and she's walking in front of me going up the stairs so I put my first foot on the step following up behind her and the it was like wow have my hairs got hairs on them the, the sensations and the rushing and the flushing through the body was just incredible but at the same time I was also experiencing this oh wow I can see the stairs they go up and they go round and then they come out at the top and just on the left if you you take a, another step to the left you go into the bathroom and oh no what's in the oh wow that what I saw in all these things as I'm walking up the stairs by the time I had got to the second row of stairs turning around to twist and come up my eyes were watering that much I could barely see out of them. I was experiencing a complete and utter sensation all over my body. There was this instant knowing of what had gone on in that place and it was shocking. And what I saw I didn't want to believe and so you know I mean, I even said to this friend of mine, I said, can you feel that? What, what's going on here? And she said, what do you mean? She wasn't going through any of this, yet it felt like I had just walked into hell and was being inundated with a version of it. So we sat over in the corner. I insisted on sitting in the corner. I wouldn't sit anywhere else. I tried to get her to go and sit somewhere else outside, but 
No, we just sat up there and I swore, you know what, I'm never going to do that again. But um, before I tell you what went through me at that moment, um, I'll tell you that shortly after this, um, she had finished setting up the Just Jeans shop and they were looking for a store manager, someone to take it on and she had recommended me. So basically I was given the job of store manager and I went in there and managed the shop on my own after I'd done two weeks training at Chadston and um, went in there and managed the shop on my own. I had a casual that would come in to give me the occasional RDO but other than that you know it was my shop that I ran and pretty much left to my own devices anyway but uh, so I'd taken over running this shop and it was a job I didn't want to do bar work anymore in fact I was feeling you know very restless about it's time to move on I was going to WA time to get out but then this was offered to me and I thought well why not and I would brushed aside all the feelings because this is what you're trained to do you know oh it's not reasonable it's not rational I mean you, you don't know that but I tell you what you do know that the thing when you experience complete sensory perception in a place that is telling you in more ways than one not just through your physical senses but through what comes to then be like a knowing you don't know how you know it you just do it wasn't there before but this place somehow put it in there it's it's the library vibration of the memory of somewhere whether it's memory whether it's ghosts I don't know because this is what I saw as I'm walking up the stairs I saw the bathroom just up at the top and that's when my eyes started to cry because of all the children the small naked children that I saw in the bathtub with grown men these grown men didn't have any clothes on and when they did have clothes on there was a large group of them that were always coming in and out of this building there were always children coming and going in this building and they did things to these children all these men in these black robe suits and the thing is that I didn't know it at the time because uh, you know <laughs> you come to work you go, you go back I'd never walked down the side street but from this instance I knew that there was a, a synagogue or something right behind us I knew it was there because that's where the men came from they used to come from the synagogue through down the laneway past the coal things and up the stairs and into the house with the children and these were supposed to be religious men but that wasn't the shocking worst thing of it the um, there are bodies still there of the children buried in the basement these activities have never been uncovered and there are bodies in the basement just at the end of the shop the door that goes out the back I didn't know it until after I'd been working there and I moved away the lay-by stand and I had an instantaneous flash there are a lot of dead children down in that basement and every time after that I walked past that I had to go out the back I would run past that it was like I didn't want what was there to catch me there was so much evil done in that place it left an impression and boy what an impression it is now 
of a night time there was um, late night trading Thursday nights so I would trade till nine o'clock and that meant that I had to go out through the the back of the shop and go out the back door and up the laneway past the coal the the coal bunker basement type things and I hated it you know I uh, I've all even though in my younger years I was really scared of the dark there got a time where I had no fear of it at all because I realized you know what if something was going to get me it sure as hell had enough chances and it hasn't so I'm not going to be scared of it anymore what have I been scared of but when I am scared I know that there is a reason to be scared and when I would finish at nine o'clock at night and I would go out that back door I didn't want to run because whatever was there watching me I didn't want it to think that I was scared and I tried holding this kind of you can't sense me you can't feel me and you're not going to scare me kind of thing it was it was yeah it was an intense thing and then I'd quickly walk out to my car and and get in and drive home I mean it was pitch black down that laneway and it's an old building and it even feels spooky down there because um, I seriously think that down the laneway there where those coal bunkers are that's where they brought a lot of the children in through and they would leave them in the uh, cellar area and then go down and get them out of the cellar and take them up and do whatever I don't know I'm only telling you what the impressions I got from it were so all of these feelings you know I'm feeling pretty uncomfortable but I'm thinking look you're a big girl get over it even though I still had a hard time to go even out the back door the of the shop now it was just getting too intense I didn't like being there at all and I was thinking, well, you know, maybe it's time to go to WA. And I'm thinking, yeah, but you've got a job and something different. And, yeah, let's see where it goes. So I'm in the shop one day. And see this street here, how it's got hardly anybody going down it. Well, if it's um, between 12 and 2, you can't even... Um, move there are just so many people walking around at lunchtime and just down here there was a takeaway shop it's now Baker's Delight but it was a, a fairly big takeaway shop that offered lots and lots of different types of food and so everybody came around from all the different area to get their lunch there because they they catered to everybody so this street along here was packed with people and I'm standing inside the shop now you have to understand it's not a very big shop you can almost see the back of it through the windows there it's just up the back there it's not big so I'm standing inside the shop looking at this great big flow of people and thinking well I don't think I'll duck next door and get a um, sandwich yet because I think there's going to be a big line up and you know, all that stuff's going through my head and usually I'll wait till after the lunch crowd anyway but I was a bit hungry that day so I thought I might just shut it for a couple of minutes to try but you've got to wait so long in the shop and you end up having to shut the shop for half an hour and a lot of people might want to be dropping in to buy something so I'm just standing there umming and ahhing over what I'm going to do and looking at the sea of people and thinking yeah I don't think I'm going to get into that and all of a sudden this this old guy you know he, he was must have been well into his 80s you know maybe even his 90s he was walking along with a walking stick and he was really huffing and puffing and he was walking in through the doorway here towards me and as he's walking ever so slowly you know he'd taken quite a few steps he's inside the shop now and I'm walking towards him and as I'm walking towards him because I think you know I said to him do you need a, a glass of water come and sit down 
and in response to that he didn't even put his head up and look at me he because he's making all this effort just to walk in and he's saying to me no no you can't go out there he said bad things happened here nobody should be here and I mean as he's saying this to me because I'd walked up to him and I said here you know as I'd said come and sit down or go and get your glass of water I turned around to walk towards the back door to go and get a glass and he said that to me which was what a second or two if that and I turned back to answer him and he's gone completely gone I mean it just took him all this time to walk into the shop and in a split second he's just gone and I walked out to the crowd because there was still this streaming crowd of people going by he couldn't have got back into that crowd so quickly he couldn't have where did he disappear to I even just walked straight out of the shop and walked up and down the street trying to find this slow moving guy I could not find him I mean he couldn't move faster than me he couldn't move faster than anybody I mean a turtle can move faster than him he was moving very slowly so after that that was it for me I quit my job and I went to WA and that's another story but years later I did when the internet came online try to find out if there was something that could back up what I had seen in my experience and the only thing I did know was that yes there is that synagogue and you know there's nothing nothing and that's but then I, I didn't really expect to find it because all the secrets are still buried there and they're not only buried there but the evil that was done there still vibrates even with normal people normal people have had experiences like the girlfriend that I lived with that uh, shared this um, shop with me <laughs> well shared it she got me the job um, she uh, she had told me when I'd said to her about what had happened you know after walking up those stairs and everything she said well you know it's funny you should say that because from what I've heard it's got a pretty you know bad history for keeping tenants people record strange strange events and all different sorts of things I mean she didn't go into it because I mean ultimately if you've heard something and you're not really on board with listening to it you're not going to listen to the details so all you can say is well I know I heard somebody mention something about something strange but I don't know what it was so it wasn't the only one there's a history of strangeness and I think what is even stranger is that uh, it got boarded up and nobody would live there because you couldn't get people to stay living in there and even if you owned the top of that place you would constantly have a turnover in tenants it would become a nightmare you'd think you know what maybe I'll just use it as storage and rent it out as that because no one's going to stay living in there for one reason or another for whatever happened to them well when that old guy said to me that nobody should be here bad things happened he didn't need to tell me twice I knew exactly what he meant and I wished he'd hung around and told me a little bit about what those bad things were but I don't think he needed to I already knew this was kind of like knock knock wake up we've already been telling you you shouldn't be here get the hell out and so I didn't second guess anything after that as I said I quit and I went to WA so knowledge doesn't come to us just from reading books or just from what we understand is in <laughs> the normal reality of gaining knowledge there are ways of knowing that come to you 
that cannot be explained but are more accurate and real than anything you could ever prove to anybody else but you don't need to prove it to anybody else you just need to prove it within your own reality and that was my reality you know I don't think anybody quite experienced it that way any of those that lived up there wow I couldn't even when I went and sat up there that day for lunch I couldn't even eat what I had taken for myself to eat you know and uh, I it was just completely stifling to all the senses it just overwhelmed so I suppose you know if you want to call knowing a download what I saw what I experienced you know we all have different ways of receiving information we are receivers and transmitters on all levels but especially energetically and energetically there is no boundary between dimensions and there is no distance and there is no time these are outside of the constructs of the reality that we have created for ourselves in this earth but nonetheless they are still part of it a part that I hope others will start opening themselves up to experience that greater part of themselves all right not this bad experience but what I'm saying is that my instinct in the first place was on alert it wasn't on high alert but once I pushed into that that situation, I received, well, a very big alert level. And I ignored it. I suppressed it and thought, no, nah, I'm going to go with the normal. Because, you know, most of my growing up had been not normal. I just wanted to live a normal life and have normal things happen. I didn't want this. And, uh, yeah, the the day that that guy walked in it was like nah stuff this <laughs> I've been getting all the warnings I know what's going on here I can feel it I know it you know what I'm not second-guessing it time to move on and speaking of time to move on it's time to move on from the subject and end that one because uh, as I said I went to WA and that's another story altogether I just wanted people to understand that your own personal knowledge does not necessarily have to come from the physical world there are more ways of gaining knowledge or no ledge <laughs> yes n to know something uh, interestingly the fact uh, I, I couldn't even describe to you how I can say that the word science consists of SC which means to know and ENS being the state of being so science actually means to be in the state of knowing and I kind of laugh at that because if anything science is anything but knowing it is all about theory and guesswork learning and finding out and replacing old theories with more advanced understandings so knowing in science there is very little knowing and very little state of knowing lots of theories lots of guessworks that end up being called laws and saying this is the way it works but you know that in isolation they may but if you take into consideration all the laws of the universe and other factors well it doesn't balance out so until it balances out and that's why in the same Harriman's uh, black hole movie which um, I can't upload to YouTube because they pulled it down I tried on another channel it got blocked for copyright claim so I uploaded it to Bitchute so that people could watch that because uh, that's a kind of a concept of the universe as I see it 
when I first was told about Nassim Harriman, um, when was, it was actually when I was at this community. One of the few things these boys at the community were good for was that they did give me a few handy hints and one of them said to me, have you seen Nassim Harriman's black hole? That's because I had been talking about my concept of the universe to this guy. And I said no. So I went and had a look at it. And when I watched that movie, um, well, it was a movie. It was kind of like a documentary. It was another one of those things where I had some aha moments where he was kind of explaining so much of what was in my head, but I couldn't find words to explain. I mean, I've tried to. I've tried to find words. I've tried to do it in geometry. I've tried to explain it in so many different ways. But it is such a complex thing that I have trouble separating it down into simple things to actually say it so that it can be shared in either voice or words. So this is how come I understand that I know that the, every human brain is a massive computer. I mean right now I have got so many things going on so, inside of my brain as you all have and most of those are occurring on a non-physical level and you don't understand even how many multitasks you are performing in this instance even when you think you are only focusing in one point. That's only because your attention is focused at one point in the physical right now but there are many aspects to you and if you didn't understand what an aura might be I want you to go up to another person and I want you to just feel their skin and tell me can you feel warmth off that can you feel warmth in their body that vibrancy that blood pumping through that energy that life that is all part of a an electromagnetic system that is being housed in a physical body to contain a small portion of your vastness in consciousness that you call the soul. You experience much more than what you perceive you know. Even when you're driving along in a car, you know, all of us have done it where we've gone into auto mode because our thoughts have taken us somewhere and you drive a couple of k's down the road you've gone through a couple of traffic lights you've let pedestrians cross the street you know you've avoided all the the traffic hazards you've followed all the rules and you've been doing everything right but you haven't been physically in that moment consciously doing it it's been an automatic response because your focus was somewhere else and that happens to us all because um, you know <laughs> this is where I find it almost impossible to you know the new age movement where they say you've got to clear all the thoughts from your head I tell you that to clear all the thoughts from your head you would have to be brain dead there is no possible way you can clear the thoughts from your head it is housing a complex consciousness well not only a head but that's where we perceive all our thoughts and everything are our personality even though it is the whole of our body not just the head although we think of the heart for emotions but we also have made that a distinction too that the head for thinking and intellect and the heart for emotions I mean you cannot separate them they are all intertwined it's like the um, new age era as I said I, I, I gave up on them because I got stuck in this bubble of love and light they talk about oh you've got to integrate you know the dark aspects of your life you've got to integrate and be balanced in both dark and light and yet all of them are going around just being love and light 
I'm sorry, but that's not very balanced. You know, balanced is actually taking the dark and the light and balancing it. It's not just going, oh, love and light. Yes, it's what we focus on. I'm just going to choose to ignore that there's pedophiles and all these other things. Someone else will fix that. I'm just going to choose to be in this existence. Love and light. Yeah, balanced. And you know, they get stuck in this narrative and yeah, they make a successful business out of it. It's not real. That's why I suppose I'm speaking out now too because I'm so over all the fakeness and even those that are coming out now that are bagging the truth of community and saying, oh, that's all corrupted too. It's like, duh, and even you who are saying it's corrupted are corrupted. You're the ones actually leading the corruption. Like right now, I've been listening to this, this one person very closely. I hear them say, stand up, wake up, you know. And then in the next breath, turn around and say, but don't have a stake in the outcome. No stake in the outcome. And in my brain, that just doesn't compute. I mean, how can you stand up, wake up, and have no stake in the outcome? If you have no stake in the outcome, what you have is apathy. What are you going to do if you've got no stake in the outcome? What outcome? I'm just going to sit back and wait for someone else to do it. So in my mind, saying wake up and stand up and having the philosophy of, you know, no stake in the outcome are contradictory. Of course you have to have a stake in the outcome. If you don't have a stake in the outcome, you're not going to stand up. You're not going to wake up. You're just going to sit back and take what's dished to you. That's when you've got no stake in the outcome is to take what people give you. Not what you want or need, but what they say you get. Now, is that what you want? Do you want to stand up and wake up? Or do you want to be apathetic and have no stake in the outcome? And that comes to one of my pet peeves over the years too, because you have the new age industry saying, you know, you've got to set your intent in thoughts create reality but you know have no expectation of form and I'm thinking well if I've got no expectation of form what am I going to create what do I intend to create to form if I've got no expected form that I should receive it in you know <laughs> send me a burger but yeah make sure it's all been run over by a car 50 times and spat on and trod on on and then give it to me. No, I don't want it that way. I have an expectation or form that it will be delivered edible. So again, it was a contradiction of how can you have an intent to create something and thought creates matter and yet say, well, you know what, don't expect what what form it comes in don't limit what form it comes in just sit back and see what comes to you again this is not being in charge of creating your own reality this is apathy sitting back and saying well you know the universe delivered it to me this way and I don't really like it but you know this is must be what I needed no it's not what you needed thought does create reality and more to the point is that even science, even though they do not have the, the framework to completely explain it or even prove it, more and more even mainstream science are saying that it is thought that creates reality. But they're never going to find the God particle, you know, that, that final piece of division. Because as long as you are looking for something, you will keep in a fractal existence where you can keep going into infinity, both in and outwards, you will always find yet a smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller component. You will never reach the end. There is no end. So they set up all these Hadron Colliders you know, and they find the Higgs boson and they go, oh, we found the God particle, you know, this is 
this is it, this is as small as it gets. No, it's not. You have merely unwrapped another layer and there is an infinite number of layers. But trust me, you are never going to be able to perceive them with physical um, devices. There is much more out there. But then again, with CERN, they're not actually looking so much into the physical. They actually state on their website that they are going through into other dimensions looking for resources to bring back. So I'm not saying it. CERN are saying it, that they go into other dimensions to bring resources back. My question is, what are those resources? So everything that is done by science, like with CERN, like with um, the uh, MK Ultra programming and uh, the Men Who Stare at Goats movie that I'll uh, introduce in the next video, um, all of these things go back to how man has tried to make technology to utilize the inherent qualities that are intangible within all people. They've tried to harness the energies, the frequencies of human beings and to control them. I'm not going to get too much into frequencies because again that's like Egyptian hieroglyphs. That's a really big fascinating subject because when it comes down to it, the only thing that actually exists in the universe is frequency. And everything that exists has its own resonant frequency within planes or dimensions of consciousness and levels of existence. So anyway, I think I've said enough about that. I introduced my uh, physical library so that, and I will leave links in the description so that you can go there and have a look. Um, I've tried to break them down into smaller downloads so that, you know, some of them are over two gigabytes though. So if you wanted to have a look at the individual files instead of uh, just downloading them all or whatever, I mean the choice is yours. And uh, with that, I'll say, I'll, I'll see you next time. Catch you later.